How are you? You are in Australia now. I saw you last time about a year ago. We had a struggle in Finland with COVID together and it's been a journey after that. That was a journey. That was uh that was a year ago. Wow. That's uh that's crazy to think about. Mhm. Uh, ever since you you started uh or didn't start it, you changed the name of your venture. Uh, a year ago it was called Love Out Loud and now you're calling it In Truth. Uh, what made you do that kind of choice? Uh the, the company is still called Love Out Loud, but In Truth is the name of the technology. So we were looking for a name that sort of uh summarized what the technology does and um aspires to do, which is really put people back in touch with with their truth and to make that measurable and a bit more kind of scientific than I guess it's been historically as as the truth has been quite a subject of debate over the millennia. <laughs> What our tech is basically doing is is guiding people um to understand that the body does know the difference between deceit and truth and basically to utilize that to un- unlock um yeah more alignment in your life less resistance make makes it easier to to really achieve the things that you are wanting to achieve uh, how does it do that exactly can you can you reveal at this point anything yeah of course it's um it's what i love to talk about i mean the, the noticing or the concept for the technology actually came from many years working in facilitation um and noticing specifically in mental health noticing that when people were being guided to a place where their belief system was being challenged they basically have two choices in that state of cognitive dissonance one is to reject the the version of reality that's challenging their belief system and the other is to let go of the the form of belief systems that were holding them back and expand into that new possibility but interestingly on us on a neurological and physiological level at in that state of cognitive dissonance what i would notice as a facilitator is there were all of these kind of biomarkers that were very consistent and universal you could uh see maybe someone disassociating on a neurological level or really moving towards an idea or getting really freaked out and running away from the idea you could really see it in in the way that you know that they were moving their eyes for instance their heart rate would increase uh the, their muscle tension would become uh you know w- would would vary depending on where they were moving in that process of either accepting or rejecting um and this became really a guiding um i guess a guiding light when i was facilitating people because i could notice the more that they were able to relax their nervous system and i was able to sort of support them to do that the easier it was for them to move into that new reality and so there was a lot of observation i guess that started to happen prior to um ever thinking even to go into technology but through that observation realizing there's something very universal about this and what if uh, what what if i could eliminate the need for me to be here and have this be a very manual or analog process and actually have the measurement of belief and aligning to new beliefs be something that a technology could could support people on a subconscious level to um to do day to day how transformative would that be not only on an individual level but a but a global level and so the the tech um we spent a long time in R&D sort of looking at the right biomarkers to uh to 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 be utilized to measure what we now call a C score so a coherence score which um comprise of three key data points in the first instance the first being EEG but specifically arousal and balance so what's happening in the mind um when it's exposed to the stimulus i.e. a belief system so take the example of i'm in perfect health when you're exposed to that belief system what's actually happening on a neurological level um in your brain uh what's happening to your state of arousal and is your mind moving towards that idea or, or away from it the second data point uh being the equivalent of a muscle test um which a kinesiologist would use to measure the amount of congruence in your body physiologically when exposed to a stimulus so is your body becoming contracted tight tense or is it able to sort of receive that that stimulus with ease mm. and the third being uh arousal um specifically relating to stress so is your body going into stress and if it's going into stress how quickly is it able to recover from stress um that's a special interest of mine because i would notice that there's a huge link between um someone's stress level and their ability to be fluid and flexible 
i.e. like let go of limiting beliefs and, and accept and embrace new beliefs. Uh, but that specific data point is often used in the medical sphere to diagnose things like adrenal fatigue. So it's a very different application of the technology, but we're basically taking those three data points, uh, looking at how they correlate, exposing the individual to the stimulus, i.e. belief system or a bold statement, and then um, with the algorithms that we're developing, basically produce a C-school, which will give an alignment out of 100% how aligned are you to that belief? As an example, I'm in perfect health. Um, so it might be 23% alignment. And then going through a process, we could basically identify what's in the way of you um, not experiencing total alignment <clears throat> to that goal statement and then support you to unblock whatever those blocks were so that you could come into total alignment with the things that you truly want to believe and, and have your reality sort of mirror back those new beliefs. Got it. So to me, it sounds like a very advanced version of a lie detector. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, are, are, sort are, of. Yeah, get it. In, in a way. Of, of in a way. Uh, yeah. Do people get this data about themselves uh, or their beliefs and how their body reacted to these statements? Uh, how can you support them after that? How is the individual's journey when, when they get the data back uh, and they want to change their beliefs or they want to change themselves or be more in truth? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, this will definitely evolve as the tech evolves. The The manual kind of version that will launch at first will be um, very sort of heavy on question asking. So asking the questions, how many subconscious beliefs are there? Obviously, the body is giving an indication of what it's reading to be true or not true. So is there one subconscious block, two subconscious blocks, three subconscious blocks? so on and so forth. When were these um, blocks trapped, for instance, were they trapped between the years of zero and five? So basically you could use a very manual process of question asking to determine um, how many blocks there are and what the blocks are, uh, if they're conflicting belief systems, if they're yeah, trapped emotions, if they're traumas that have been trapped in the body that are basically creating an incongruence. So really there's a lot of... Um, sort of, I guess, assumed knowledge to really understand why the technology is powerful as well, because as we know, like our medical system very much looks at our um, entire kind of system as a human being in, in separation so frequently. So we don't, not many of us really understand that we are an integrated system. And so that's kind of one of the first principles that people are really going to need to start to accept in order to, to understand the, the true power of what is being developed. As we evolve and grow, I believe um, whatever is blocking someone from experiencing, you know, complete alignment to certain beliefs could actually be uh, rectified purely through frequency. Um, but that's that's sort of the the long road of of clinical trials and testing that we have to go on as a company to to look at the most seamless ways to unblock the blocks in the way of um, you and the sort of vibrational reality that you're trying to call in. Um, yeah, so that's sort of to come, but for now we can, we can stick with the manual process and, and trust that there's going to be sort of, uh, paths forward that eliminate the timeliness of that process from the equation. Got it. Uh, last time when, when uh, it was one year ago and the project was on a different phase, but that time you were developing an app to, to, to have the, uh, sensors of a smartphone to use them as a to as a measure to to use them to measure this biofeedback uh you were thinking about a bracelet that time uh has this developed uh into which direction yeah Is so it still still, um it will be used as 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 an app yeah so the the ui will be basically you're presented with an app and you can type in the stimulus um into the app like the belief um we are using the gyroscope in the, in the iPhone as one of our data points. The second data point is uh, using EEG through a focus band, which is a, a hardware product, uh, one of our partners. And the third um, being something like a Fitbit Sense, which has EDA technology integrated into, into it as well. Um, part of our key sort of challenge was how do we, uh, how do we create sort of unique IP as a company uh, that uh, sort of achieves the thing that we're trying to achieve. 
Um, and that for us, can, and, and the sort of at the level of efficacy that we wanted as well, because a lot of these data points, um, the efficacy isn't high enough for us to really validate it at a, on a medical level, which is where I'm wanting to take the technology eventually, because I believe it has the capacity to sort of radically transform systems like health through more um, non-invasive solutions to some uh, of the illnesses, physical and, and non-physical, that we experience. Uh, but, yeah, it's been a real journey to look at how we can pull multiple data points at first, train the C-score through our algorithms, and then the intent will be thereafter looking at how we could phase out um, maybe two of those three data points because there's been enough learning against one of the data points, so we might be left with the, the the ability to use, say, just the sensor in the smartphone, but rather than having it be a 60% efficacy, we've trained it to become, you know, a 95% efficacy, for instance, which um, which is where I want to get to. But at first, to use it, you'll need uh, two, two pieces of hardware and, and a smartphone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, you, you're very dedicated uh, into what you do. I already know that much. And you've been like that for a long time. Uh, so, uh, can you tell me a little bit about your journey? What pushed you into into working with with the technology that keeps people in truth? Why is that important to you? Yeah, um, I really never thought that I would work in tech. Just just for the record, um, for, for any listeners that you know maybe uh, are thinking about how to change the world and haven't necessarily come across the the pathway that they'll end up on. Even several years ago, if you had told me that I'd be working in tech, I just, I couldn't have understood how that would ever come to be. It really was understanding that there was a system that I was working with in such a different stratosphere to technology that became so sort of um, consistent that I sort of observed that it could become a technology. Keep in mind, I knew nothing about technology. Like I was on meetings at the start of this journey, Googling in the meeting, what is an API? What is you know what is what is this? Because I really was just so not a technologist in any way. Um, even hated social media. You know that's that's how adverse I was to technology. So um, my journey was very different. I um I was very much you know dedicated to working with people on the ground in communities. I had a pretty extensive background as an entrepreneur, but pretty unique journey in that it was a very mission led. Um, it was a very mission-led path that entrepreneurship sort of became like the byproduct of what I had to teach myself in order to to share my message with the world, which came from a health crisis I went through as a teenager, a uh, mental health crisis, being an eating disorder and, and really going through a health system that I felt I was never going to heal in Um just because that there was a real absence of compassion, there was a real absence of what I felt was really human and needed. Um, and I observed a lot of other people within that health system sort of beside me as well, becoming more and more lost. And, and this was meant to be the space where people came to, you know, heal trauma. And, and even at that age, it just never really made, never made sense to me. And naturally in my mind asked questions. And some of those questions were, well, if, if, if the people who are sort of put in positions of authority to help people heal during some of the most vulnerable, difficult times that, you know, they're having to go through, if they can't be present, truly present with the pain um, that's right there in front of them, and, and in, in practice that would look like, you know, a constant stream of referrals or, or just like a disassociation from the person in front of them and looking at, at a human being as a series of symptoms rather than a human being with, you know, their own mind, heart, soul, feelings. Um, I just naturally started to ask, where else does this play out in our world? And what is the what is the consequence of not um, truly being able to be present with the human experience? And I guess it was an obsession with that question. You know, how are we meant to solve the world's biggest problems if um, we can't even be present with one another? Uh, and that was that was very obvious to me going through that experience and, and I came out of that experience <clears throat> a realizing I had to if I was going to heal I had to choose healing and I had to be present with all of the things that not only others didn't want to be present with but that the, ultimately I was really scared to be present with and that, that had to be a journey I chose for myself and it didn't really matter you know 
how sophisticated the, the, the practitioners were around me until I was willing to do that. Nothing was going to change. Um, and obviously I did heal myself and I, I started to, to transform in, in pretty radical ways against all odds. And I wanted to share that message with the world. And I wanted to, to put, I guess, the practice and the processes that I had applied to my own life, which were very simple, active listening, you know, willingness to move into the pain and feel pain and not avoid it. Um, I started to apply that in, in groups that I started to, to lead. Um, and it was just, it was very amazing to see the results because what kind, what kind I didn't of results feel like I was introducing. Uh, so some of the time it was quite miraculous healings, you know, people that had chronic pain being held in a space where they were finally able to, I guess, speak their truth, um, to face the things that they were really scared to face would come up to me after, um, the sessions and say, you know, this chronic pain I've had in, in my neck for years and years has, has just dissolved or people that were struggling with, um, really kind of severe mental health issues who would report that they'd been on prolonged, um, streams of medication and, um, had seen, you know, X, Y, and Z practitioner and nothing was helping, but actually being held in a space where they were able to speak their truth be held in a state of compassion, non-judgment and acceptance was the, was the thing that they needed to actually, you know, transform their beliefs about themselves, um, and, and life and their experiences. Uh, and then on a community level, as that work scaled and grew through my first organization, which was a, a nonprofit that focused on community, de community development as a means to solve the mental health crisis, I started to see on a community level, when an entire community would apply these principles, the kind of transformation that would occur on a, on a collective level, which looks like reduction in suicide, which looks like higher attendance at schools, which looked like, um, you know, less, um, less unemployment, um, less uh, addiction. So seeing it applied such a simple and, you know, for the most part free solution that had very real results in communities that the government was trying to spend billions and billions of dollars trying to fix. But their solution was to pump money into, you know, more systems that still lacked presence. And so I, it really taught me that it's far more to do with the frequency, the intent, the vibration that you bring to a problem that is going to either yield a result or not. You can have all the resources in the world, um, but if you're trying to solve a, a problem that's rooted in fear and you're spending millions of dollars from a, from a place of fear <laughs> and from a vibration of fear, it doesn't actually transform the problem. Um, and it was that awareness that, yeah, continued to drive my journey forward from community development work through to working as a, a federal commissioner in, in government at a very young age and, um, and eventually developing the philosophy love out loud because I was convinced beyond measure after about eight years of doing that work that, that, that love really is the solution as cliche as that might sound. Um, and what I wanted to achieve was something that was a lot more quantifiable, you know, something that we could actually understand, apply, um, implement as a strategy in life um, and beyond. And in doing that, really recognizing this is a message and a philosophy that people get, that they want to get behind. And I guess from there, the natural next step was to start thinking about how we could make it autonomous in its application, i.e. technology. Uh, yeah, there's many questions that I want to ask from you, but first I would like to ask, uh, what do you mean by love? Especially a quantifiable <laughs> love. Well, such a great question. Um, to me, love is is really the the source of of life, you know. And so, when when you are connected to that source without resistance, um, when you're not separating your, yourself from that source in some way, which which happens through yeah, basically the, the, the constructs of the ego and, and identity, then you uh, you have access to, to the infinite nature of life, the infinite nature of healing, 
um, and that really is available to all of us. But yet so few of us know that. And I think love's been hijacked in so many ways by Hollywood and Disney, which have taught us that, that love is this idea of, you know, someone coming to save, to save us. <laughs> um, and, and really that's, that's not, well, it's not what I know to be true about love. Um, although romance is beautiful, the word itself comes from pain, you know, it's, um, it's a lot deeper than that. And in, in many languages, there's more than one word for love. You know, we, we have a very limited uh, way of understanding love, I think, just by this one word, uh, but it's lost its, it's, um, it's lost its depth, you know, and, and people no longer understand that love ultimately is action. It's a verb. It's a, it's a, something that you, that you do, you know, and that's, that's where love out loud sort of seeks to help reconnect people to this idea that yes, there's this, this source of love inside of you, but you can't really access love's full potential or power until you learn to, to give that, to express it. And in order to do that freely, you've got to do some work on yourself. Most likely you've got to overcome the obstacles, the fears, the resistance, the, um, whatever, like I'm going to get rejected. I'm going to get, you know, I'm not going to be accepted. What if it doesn't work? Blah, blah, blah. All those things that come up when it, when it comes to expressing your real authentic unfiltered self to the world, um, you've got to go on a journey, you know, so to work through those things so that you're able to be generous with, with that love that's inside of you. And that's what I really believe to be true freedom. Got it. And when you were working with communities uh, as a nonprofit, what were you exactly doing? Was that the time when you were traveling around for years in a caravan, uh, which I understood was one of your adventures? Yeah, that's, that's, how, that's how I started in the very beginning, considering I had no you know, no funding and I just had to really strip it back to, the, to bare basics. Um, but honestly, some of the best years of my life, so, so pure, those years. Um, and in the very, very beginning, not many people wanted to attend a workshop on um, healing and vulnerability and love, especially in remote parts of Australia at some of the roughest, you know, communities that you'll ever, ever see. Um, mm-hmm. But it really was just tenacity and belief that that eventually, you know, uh, there'd be people that could kind of see the vision that I could see. But there was, in the first instance, a lot of rejection, <laughs> a lot of people saying, I don't want to participate. And then when a few people would participate, you know, they'd do it very begrudgingly. Um, however, it started to grow, you know, and I think the story was quite compelling in the very beginning. So the one community would tell the next community that there was this, you know, crazy crazy chick that was traveling and wanting to talk about these things and people got curious and then um someone a big uh superannuation company wanted to sponsor me and then the media wanted to cover the story and it it really it started to sort of grow in this really amazing very organic way um and before i knew it i had workplaces universities schools you know community groups all wanting to participate in this process which looked like Again, very simple. Let's all sit in a circle. (laughs) Let's check in with ourselves, you know, what's present. And, and, you know, there's permission here to actually share whatever that is for you. Um, I guess, you know, models like AA use a very similar process. (laughs) Um, But it's simple, but it's effective. Uh, And then as I developed that model out, um, communities at large wanted to engage me for um, community development work, which is really where I started to sort of deepen that um, that work with with communities. And what I would do is basically identify what all of the stakeholders were in the community. So in these communities, there was probably only a thousand people that lived in the whole community, right? So not many stakeholders. It'd be like students, teachers, parents, the police, maybe you know other services the people that work the library, you know, (laughs) that's that's maybe it. Um, And I would go and engage uh, with them just independently. And my process would basically just be to listen, to ask very simple questions and listen and hear where um, basically where they were blaming each other. You know, the the parents would say it's the, the teacher's fault that my kid you know, takes drugs and the kid would say that it's the police's fault because they can't go and hang out at the skate park 
you know, and, and have their outlet because the police are always blah, 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 you know, and it, it would just be this kind of rat race of um, all wanting the same thing ultimately but blaming each other as to why they don't have that thing. And I would still go through the process and listen, listen. Yeah, exactly. It's externalizing yeah. everything. And then I would bring everyone together in the community hall or whatever the space was. And my job wasn't to um, tell them what I thought. My job was to just relay what I had heard. And it was always quite amazing that when you when you actually relayed what I ha- what I would hear, they would start to notice that they actually all wanted the same thing, and the pattern of behaviour was the same, even though you know the detail was someone else's fault. You know, basically what they were doing was all the same, and what they wanted was all the same, and it would it would most of the time be a very unifying experience where at the end all of these community members would understand, wow, we actually all want to get along. <laughs> you know, There's more of what makes us the same than what separates us. And that would give me the opportunity to sort of introduce some frameworks, which at that point I was calling um, emotional infrastructure. So teaching people about basically emotional intelligence, how to communicate effectively with each other, how to listen, you know, very simple things um, uh, that they began to sort of implement into their schools, into their council meetings, into their whatever. Um, And a lot of these communities had very low capacity um, on many levels, you know, not much economy, uh, not a high level of education, numeracy, literacy. But through implementing this, they were able most of the time to come together stronger as a community and look at how they could actually you know, work more cohesively because a lot of them were disenfranchised. There was very high suicide rate, very high rate of addiction. So in the context of that, you know, the the problems just get worse generation after generation. Um, And, yeah, it was was quite amazing and and very inspiring. And that that, it was advocating for that 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 took my journey into into politics. (laughs) Got it. How do you see uh, people changing their beliefs? What What is the way? <laughs> uh, having a relaxed nervous system, number one. one. Learning to relax the body and the mind so that you can actually be receptive to something you do. Um, which obviously, you know, that's what our tech is attempting to support people with. Um I think really knowledge is power. So many people don't realize that when their belief or their reality is getting challenged, they're going into a state of defense. You know, they're moving into a state of resistance to that change. Um, You know, most people don't realize they have a subconscious mind. Most people don't realize that the reason they experience reality the way they do is because of their belief systems. Um, Or there's a righteousness with their beliefs, like, you know, my view of the world in this way is more righteous than than yours, and and they don't people can't see that that's actually causing them more suffering, and it's causing others more suffering as a consequence of that. Rather than dropping those barriers, those guards, and practicing receptivity, you know, and curiosity, I I currently believe the things I believe, and I'm meeting another person that is almost guaranteed to have different belief systems to me. What can I learn about the, the way they see the world? If you can start there, um, you will have a much more fulfilled life because it's not, it isn't fulfilling to constantly defend your position. It's exhausting. You spend all of your energy doing that and not actually learning and expanding. Um And I think we also need to recognize in a world like the world at present that just because someone else believes something different to you doesn't threaten your position. (laughs) And I think um, we've gotten very bad at knowing how to listen to people who have different views to us because the solution so frequently is to just reject. And then the way that that's being conditioned is quite astronomical through our current use of tech, which is just keeping us within this echo chamber of of our own worldview, which is just sort of feeding this this narcissism that like the whole world agrees with me. And so if you don't agree with me, you must be, you know, wrong or or unworthy or whatever it is. But actually 
your your capacity to expand your mind and to hear, literally hear difference has been compromised through this constant exposure to being um, told yes uh, to your own worldview. I think that that's very, very dangerous place for us to be as a society. Mm -hmm. uh, in this current state of affairs in the world, uh, well, with, with everything that's been happening, where, where do you, what's your hope in? Because people <laughs> tend to be a little bit, <laughs> a, little, a little bit struggling here and there. And we all, all need hope from somewhere. So, so where do you get yours? Uh, I like to, um, connect more to faith than hope. I think hope, um, has its place, but it's also quite futile in, in a lot of ways because it's quite passive. Um, I think faith is a lot more powerful. And, yeah, for me that, that comes down to I do believe in infinite possibilities and I believe in, in an infinite intelligence that, that governs our existence, however you want to see that. Um, from my experience, the more I uh, believe in that with conviction, you know, have unwavering faith, the more I experience in my own life not being defined by circumstances, you know, you can, you can see a recession happening in front of your eyes or, you know, this or that or all these external kind of storms that seem really grave in a lot of ways and yet still we have the capacity to, to practice this amazing conviction if we are willing to um, have alignment and integrity to what we're calling forward and the, the miracle will be equally distributed to you no matter what's happening on the outside. And, and so for me, that's, that's what I rest in, that it doesn't matter what it looks like. That never stops being true. Have you seen, uh, have, have you tried your technology? Uh, you probably have, but have you tried it and experienced uh, miracles or marvelous things in your own life? Uh, not yet through the tech, but I'm sure that will come in my own life in general, 100%. Definitely. Like uh, the way I see miracles, miracles are happening all the time. Whether or not we have the sensitivity to uh, acknowledge them and see them and, and actually have that be part of our conscious experience, it's another thing. But everything you know, really ultimately is a miracle. The fact that you're living and breathing and talking and all of the virtues that we get given, you're able to see, taste, you know, smell, no. touch. The, these things are miracles. Um, no. Yeah, but not everyone sees them like that. I think it's, it's Alan Watts that says, um, you know, we're all looking for, for these virtues, um, that, that these external virtues that we see are just these uh, stuck on kind of, um, facades, the real virtues are the virtues that, that are our birthright. The fact that we, that we have eyes to see, you know, and, uh, a mouth to taste. These are the true virtues. These are, these are the real miracles. Um, we just need to come back to that and actually practice gratitude for what's present. We got it. Uh, what are your plans in the future regarding the, uh, but say for the next two years, when are you launching? When can others experience your technology themselves? We're testing at the moment, but in in a beta in a beta way. So we're beta testing, um, and it's sort of in stages. So companies and um, teams will be able to use um, the tech in controlled groups from. Uh, end of Q1 next year and then a B2B type subscription will be ready uh, like Q3, Q4 next year. We decided to delay the B2C app until after we scale up the B2B license um, offering with the tech uh, because we want to basically utilize the, the research from controlled groups where we can understand the questions people are asking. It's, it's a big, it's been a big running for us to, 
to understand how little people understand about the subconscious mind. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. you know, really 90% of our challenge, developing the tech is a challenge, but the, the, I think the real challenge is actually education, educating the world to know um, what this is, you know, because because the, the major application of a technology like this, when it is available to a consumer market, it becomes, it has the capacity to become very powerful. Like for instance, if there was a nuclear war announced tomorrow and we truly did have half a billion people on the platform um, and that was announced, but we could send a push notification out to that many people that would be enough to sort of affect change in a, in a way of critical mass um, and say, hey, would you like to become congruent to the belief I live in a peaceful world? And then at the touch of a button, actually have that alignment occur in a vast enough capacity that it has the ability to actually eliminate that possibility of war from the timeline. It really becomes a technology that has huge power to shift and direct human consciousness at large. So the the ethical questions around what we're developing are also a really big component of this. Um, Yeah, so, you know, without going to into the granular of what, what that means. Um, at least for the next 12 months, as we validate the tech, it's important that we have some uh, metric of monitoring and controlling how the tech's applied and used. Mm-hmm. Okay. One thing I wanted to ask you also, uh, that you had made a course, uh, what was Enlightenment for Millennials? Was, was that the name? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that about- well, um, the, the, with the book. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's the book. So the the love out loud um, started as a book, and it, there's nine principles of love that that are explored in the book. Can you can you recite those principles quickly? Uh, yeah. So the first is belief. No surprises there. So we have to believe mm-hmm. that change is possible in order to. Uh, affect it. The second is honesty. So basically the principle is we can't hear what we don't reveal. We have to be willing to to really face it and be honest about it. Um, Once you do that, you move into a state of acceptance. So you start learning to accept maybe the truths that you've pushed away, um, haven't been able to face. You accept yourself, others in that process. When you reach that true place of acceptance, stage four, is death. So there's some kind of, um, hopefully not physical death, but metaphysical or spiritual death of an identity. Um, and you come out the other side in stage five, which is purpose with a new sense of purpose in the world and meaning. Um, and that moves into creativity and then creativity into acknowledgement where you have the, the, the power once you've created something from the experience so far to really acknowledge why things happen the way that they did and stand very strong in that. And then from acknowledgement, you move into to gratitude um, where you're maybe able to reflect on those hard times and actually experience a true gratitude for how much it's grown you. And then the ninth phase, which is service. So service to others being kind of the highest expression of love. Mm. That's very beautiful. I should read the book again. I read it read it a year ago quickly. I think I would understand more about it now. Uh, <laughs> we learn a lot about I, in Yeah, I think this has been an interesting year for I, I'd say everybody. I mean, <laughs> I mean you had your ex- experience certainly in Finland that time. But how do you remember that? Like it's it's been a year now. You were in a whole room, hotel room in a in a COVID by yourself, stuck there for a while, and all that. That was so bad. That was really so bad. I was so sick. I don't think I've ever been so sick, to be honest. <laughs> I don't want to yeah, agree with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dad. Okay, I got one last question I'd like to ask from you. It's it's the question I already asked you once, but I would like to ask it again. Uh if it's a, if it's the year 2092 uh, and it things go your way, how do you see the world? What do you see outside the window? Outside the window, that's a cool question. Yeah, huh? I think um, definitely like portals to other other galaxies. I definitely want like portal travel where we could just go to different parts of the universe. That would be pretty cool. Um, regenerated cities for sure, you know, so things are in harmony with nature. Um, 
I, I when I think about the future in that way, I, I almost see like um matter, like physical matter isn't so dense. So matter is kind of more um it's more etheric. There's a lightness to matter and matter can sort of move um through intent. So it, it's not as heavy, like you don't have to go and pick up a brick and literally pick it up. You can use maybe telekinesis or intention to move matter. So you can really see that the truth or what I see to be the truth of reality a little bit clearer in that it's it's energy in motion. So that, so that everything looks kind of uh, like luminous and light. Um, and what else is going on? Like people are in a general state of integrity and truth. You know, there's no, there's no shadiness. There's not, there's nothing to hide. There's, and, and within that truth, there's such strength and solidarity. Wow. That's a beautiful vision. I really hope we get there. And I'm sure you are doing everything you can to work us, work us to get there. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I think think that's it. Thank you for for the interview today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Sleep tight. I hope your jet lag is better off tomorrow. <laughs> Great. <laughs>